Hi friends, welcome back to episode three of Crash and Learn. And today we're gonna be looking at a video from the Kern River in California. So this river in this video has a lot to unpack and a lot to talk about. Um, so we'll be diving into it here in a second, but I just wanna remind you and uh, you know, anybody who's watching, these Crash and Learn videos are about learning from things that happen on the river. There's a lot that happens out there and we wanna make sure that we are breaking it down as much as possible and trying to understand what our options are and what to do and how we can be better on the water. So, uh, you know, this isn't about criticizing people. It's not about making fun of people. Um, I know a lot of people like carnage videos and they like seeing them because it's just like, oh my God, look what happened to those people. But uh, that's not what this is about. And that's what, especially not this one. Mm -hmm. This one's kind of hard to watch. So if you have trouble watching carnage videos, especially some pretty gnarly ones, this is going to be a tough one to watch. Just a disclaimer up ahead, but let's get into it and let's talk about what's going on in this video. In this episode, we're gonna talk about strainer rescues. We wanna talk about layered safety, emotional state versus risk management. We wanna talk about some rescue techniques, and we also wanna talk about the concept of experience versus training. Before we get into all of that though, I really wanna set the scene for everybody so that you know exactly what we're dealing with. So here we have the Kern River, and we're just above the KR uh, number three powerhouse. Uh, it's off the screen to the right. We're gonna see that our rescuers are going to start on a beach and the beach is gonna be highlighted in this teal color right here. Now, you can see on this Google map, it's from the summer and the water's pretty low, but the water is very high in this video um, and the high water mark of the river is actually the edge of the teal that we see here. Now, also, there's a whole section downstream as gravel bar is all flooded and Based on that, I'm, I'm gonna guess, it's not in the video, but based on the elevations, I'm gonna guess that the wa high water mark is covering from uh, one side of the river to the other, these teal sections. Now, our victim is going to be stuck in the trees, and our victim is stuck kind of in this, uh, this red area, but it's really hard to tell from the Google map and the video comparing it, but we know that's the zone uh, that the victim's in. So I'm just gonna kind of place the victim right about here. And this is this is kind of the scene. We've got the victim in the tree. We know they're in the tree uh, and, and they are out of the water at the moment. So we'll see that in a second, but let's flip over to the video. We're gonna look at the beginning talk um, and let's take a look here and let's share kind of their prep. Uh, they know they gotta go save this kid. This kid's about 10 years old. Um, so we're going to kind of listen to this. Okay, yeah. And it looks like it's not too. It looks like, I mean, it just brought the boulders to trees. We just have yeah, to watch out. Yeah, it's a couple of small. Just got to watch out for the train. Yeah. But I'm thinking, if you feel comfortable, you see those two small trees in the middle there? Yeah, I'm going to try to get them between those. Yeah, and I'll try. Okay. You know, you, you, the right. problem with this, you don't know what rocks you need to get out of. And I mean, I'm pretty good at this. It's 20 years of growing. <laughs> Yeah. Might be a few more of us on that little island. Yeah, we're up there. Watch out, it's really deep right there. Okay, so that was the uh, their safety briefing. I, I'm guessing this gal with the yellow PFD is a commercial guide who has asked for some help from some private boaters. And um, there's quite a few red flags here that we want to talk about. Um, Kaylee, I know you got some, you have some strong opinions about, so let's start with that. Yeah, um, so there's quite a few different things. Um, first thing is, while you never know people's experience 
when you meet them on the river. Um, these guys are private boaters. That doesn't mean that they have less experience, but there are some red flags. So we can see that there are at least two people, including the person who's rowing, who doesn't have a helmet on. Um, and then we have a, an array of gear that um, is older um, and doesn't quite, it, yeah, look yeah. put together. Older or, gear is not a problem. Like let, yeah. let's let's start with that. I mean, if you're if you're a boater and you've been boating for a long time, you probably have quite a collection of gear. A lot of your private boating gear has been kind of kind of put together uh, over a while, and you, you know PFD foam can last if you're not ex if you're storing it in the right uh, in the right position. It's like you, you just don't want to have it. Um, be waterlogged all the time it'll start to degrade things like that so if you if you're storing your gear it's dry it's out of the sun um you know you're gonna get some good life out of your gear um that being said again yeah the helmet thing like that's a major red flag for me is like seeing two people without a helmet um in a flooded um spring trip so even if there's a, a section of river that is pretty easy and you don't generally wear helmets um usually in the springtime water's fast um you generally want to have that extra layer of, of protection especially if it's cold and you might have cold shock it takes you a little bit longer to respond um in addition a gentleman who's rowing also has a couple carabiners it's hard to tell if they're locking from here, it doesn't look like they are, but it's hard to tell um, that are just kind of loose and dangling. Um, that kind of violates some of our clean, uh, clean principle of not having things that can catch. Um, you know, uh, throw bags as well. We have a variety of throw bags that are scattered around the boat. Um, you know, they're just kind of dangling, flopping around a little bit. Um, that I really gotta emphasize that this is a strainer rescue and you really have to be careful in these sorts of things rafts and trees do not mix i actually wrapped on a tree earlier this year and had to peel my boat off the tree it was i was all up in the trees i wrapped myself around the tree uh downstream so that it's not like a good position to be in. That was not a good experience that I had. Um, and and so the thing that I, I think we want to emphasize about experience versus training is, is that we spent a, a fair amount of time this year training with fire crews. And um, I, I, I'm, I'm fairly certain if any of those fire crews came out to set shore-based safety for me that, that we worked with, they would be able to throw a throw bag a, a very long way uh, to be able to help us. Um, it is the training super complete? Um, potentially, you know, you, you have people showing up that may or may not have all the experience you need. <laughs> Are they going to be swift water rescuers? You, you know, you don't know who's going to show up. And it's the same thing with private boating. Are these people swift water rescuers? Um, from the video, I would guess probably... Uh, not that most of them are just out on a fun trip with, with friends is what it somewhat seems like. Um, I can't speak to their certifications and, and, you know, there's also the certification game where you, Oh, I got the certification. So now I can do this. And it's like, eh, it's not really true. It doesn't yeah. necessarily you pass a test. Doesn't mean you have the skills. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily because you showed proficiency <laughs> once doesn't mean you can replicate proficiency in the field. Uh, I get that aspect too. The, the thing is consistent training. Mm -hmm. And if you have not done strainer recovery and you have not done rescue work in this, or, or at least trained heavily on rescue work. Um, and, and granted, I haven't done much rescue work in my life. I'm not a, I'm not a firefighter. I'm not a rescuer. I'm just vaguely entertaining. Um, but the, the, the thing is that I've spent 22 years on the river and for a good chunk of that, I wasn't doing a lot of swift water rescue training. And because of that, my skills with knots had suffered. My skills in rescue scenarios suffered. Uh, I spent a lot of time floundering around not knowing what to do. These are all issues that we need to worry about. Um, so if you are going to train, you should train regularly, train a lot. And this year I've spent about 15 days training, like dedicated swift water rescue training. And I feel like that's not enough. Like I haven't done enough. Yeah. Um, I've been training with fire crews. I've been training with our team. Um, it, you know, I have 
worries about this scenario because when we look at the scenario, one of the things that we need to bear in mind is where the victim is. Now, the victim is 110 feet from the shore uh, and approximately seven feet of water uh, based on the elevations and kind of what I'm seeing from Google Maps. Mm -hmm. um, the width of the river here with the high water is approximately 340 feet across. And where we're looking at in the video right now, the victim is about 430 feet downstream. So it's quite a distance to cover downstream, but I know that after 15 days of training, I can chuck a throw bag pretty reliably about 65 feet. That's, that's what I got. I, I mean, I've tried throwing a 75 foot throw bag and I have trouble getting that out there. It's a lot of rope to move. It's a lot of rope to throw. I don't know. What, what do you think you can do right now? At least 40 feet. Okay. So you, you get a 40 foot throw. Um, that's if that's the range of your accuracy you're not going to get 110 feet mm -hmm. I, like i can't throw a throw i physically can't <clears throat> throw 110 feet of rope to get to somebody and the the person could be even 120 feet out uh, it's hard to tell from the water levels and comparing it to summer flows and google maps but um that's a long way to throw and set shore base safety for someone so we can pretty much assume that we have one boat in a non-shore based, with no shore based cover. So we have <clears throat> no layers of safety here. There's no one backing this crew up. And that's a big red flag for me. The training is a big red flag for me. Mm -hmm. The equipment is a big red flag for me. This is a very <clears throat> dangerous and very complex rescue operation that they're about to, to engage in. So... And I think the biggest red flag of all is not necessarily, it's not just the gear. It's not just, um, you know, not having the appropriate crew from what we can, you know, assume looking at them. But it's really going to be their um, their attitude kind of going into it. You know, that, oh, I had 20 years of experience and I'll do the best I can. And it's very lighthearted, but it's actually going to be like a complex rescue. And, you know, it's it's a pretty serious thing that they're going to get into. And so. So I feel like one of the biggest red flags that we're seeing here is the relatively nonchalant attitude. Mm -hmm. I, I, people who know me know I joke about everything and I just, I make jokes and try to make things lighthearted. Um, there are very few times that I'm not super lighthearted and this would be one of them. Mm -hmm. Like, this scenario, when I think about it and break it down, is something that is like, I honestly don't know exactly what I would do. In fact, I had to call one of our firefighter friends and all yeah. to talk about this scenario and just be like, hey, what do you think? Like, from a fire rescue standpoint, and I've talked to a couple people about this. So, um, this is really complex mm -hmm. and, and this is really a tough scenario that I feel like. I would have trouble executing on. Um, I, I might be able to do it. I'd probably take a crack, and we'll talk about this later. I'd take a crack at it, but this would be something I'd actually seriously consider calling fire crews for. Mm -hmm. um, regardless if I was on a commercial trip or not. Like, if I was a commercial guide, I'd still be considering, <laughs> like, hey, maybe we need to get some more people on this. But, um, and one of the other things, too, is that I feel like they're not setting themselves up for success because if she is a commercial guide, then there are other commercial guides here. And what has happened is that we're in a scenario where you're getting in a boat with people you don't know and haven't trained with. There are likely people that you have trained with and have worked with before. And if you do and you're on a commercial trip, um, I can say as a private boater, if a bunch of guides came up to me and said, didn't know me and said, Hey man, we need some help. Can we borrow your boat? This kid's stuck in a tree. I'd be like, yeah, if you guys think you can execute that rescue appropriately and you know, we could figure that out. Like I'd be happy to let somebody borrow my boat if mm -hmm. they needed it for a rescue. <clears throat> and, and so I, you know, I would want to be communicating to them like, Hey, I'm a swift water rescuer. I have this much experience on the river. I have done this kind of training. 
Um, I run these kinds of rivers just to show and tell everybody what uh, what I've done and, and what I know how to do and what I can execute. Um, and I probably would... I mean, the thing I would really want to do is take my ego out of it as much as possible. Yeah, and I, I think that's a big thing of, you know, he says, oh, I've been doing this 20 years and kind of laughs it off. But, you know, going on a similar commercial run uh, several times in the summertime that have rec flows that are pretty much the same all the time is very different than having experience on different rivers and different flows and having a lot more dynamic uh, experience to pull from. And so kind of that nonchalant kind of laugh it off is a big red flag for me because there's a lot of ego in that. Um, and they're not really focusing on what needs to happen. Again, we're looking at this from an outsider's perspective too. So, you know, that's a, that's a big thing, but yeah. let's go ahead and dive into this a little bit more. Um, I, you know, I think we've kind of <laughs> beat that dead horse enough, but um Let's, let's take a look and see how this rescue unfolds. So they're coming down. We've got the kid in the tree, slowing it down. And this is kind of the point I want to stop it at. You see the kid's kind of reaching and a throw bag is deployed. Um, and, and, and actually I want to get on that part right there. There we go. So let's take a look at this. We got our victim. He is a 10 year old boy. Uh, he is up in a tree. He's actually wearing appropriate uh, personal protective equipment for the cold water, mm -hmm. um, but he's not in the water. So the victim is a static victim. Um, he might be getting tired and he might be just tired of standing, um, but he's up in a tree. He's, he's not going into the water. He's presumably been there for a little while. So he's relatively safe at the moment. Um, you saw he reached out for the throw bag, uh, but one of the things I would think in this scenario is that I cannot rely on him because he's a 10 year old boy. And, and if you're 10, you can't rely on a 10 year old to be doing anchors, complex knots. Um, and, and generally I, I don't think you should be relying on a victim to be doing any of that. Um, like if I took a big swim and I was stuck in this scenario, I would encourage people that I am not even reliable enough for that because I might be shaken up. My mental state mm -hmm. might not be in the right place. Um, the water's presumably, presumably very cold because it's springtime. The river's flooded. They're wearing neoprene. Um, uh, it's a warm day. So that's something that's good, you know. Um, but yeah, it's definitely going to be cold. Also, throwing a throw bag from a boat, um, that I, I, I never really advocate that. There, there are very few rare circumstances where I might do that. But the problem is we're adding another dynamic element into an already dynamic situation, uh, and the victim might try and grab that. So... Let's go ahead and watch what happens, and we'll kind of break it down. I put together a little animated section that we can see this a little bit more. But throw bags deployed, and we just hit a tree sideways. Um, that's how boats wrap. That's how I wrap my boat earlier this year. Um, that's pretty Indiana Jones right there, like to wrap that around a, a log. But just lost the bag. So now we have rope in the water as well. Also, uh, not sure if you guys caught it, but the, the right oar was also dislodged from its oar lock. Um, so we just hit another tree. Luckily, the boat was kind of in line with the current. And the boat is now freely spinning. And it that was a recipe for a perfect wrap, too. So we had potential for one flip and two wraps in a very short amount of river. I think that was less than 100 feet of river. Mm -hmm. um, more yelling and screaming. Uh, so this is going to the mental state that we were talking about earlier with the paddlers and the rescue team is that they're in a really heightened state. There's lots of yelling. Um, I wish we had the original audio, but that, you know, that's okay. So we can obviously tell everybody's, everybody's pretty jacked up right now, but I spot the kid, he's swimming. So now we have a dynamic victim. Mm -hmm. and a very dynamic scenario. Luckily, that kid got out of the strainers. Like, 
there are several trees that you could wrap on and I, I, I was there a couple months ago. It really sucks. Um, so it's just a dangerous situation because you went from a static victim to being in the water with rope um, so, and, and strainers. So the best case scenario is a static rescue team with a static victim. Uh, but we have a dynamic rescue team with a dynamic victim that think if only one of those things is dynamic then that's you know that's amping it up on the escalation if both the victim and the rescuers are dynamic then that that kind of changes things now uh the audio comes back here uh there's a little bit of music but <laughs> So you heard them say they're going into the trees. <clears throat> there's a lot of talking here, and there's not a lot of like taking command of the situation. Um, now you'll see straight ahead, uh, kind of on river right, there is there's several boats right there, and I think that this was from a commercial trip, and if it was, it's likely that those people. That's the group with with the kid. Um, and earlier in the video, it's really hard to spot, but after watching this in super slow motion, like 40 times, I actually did spot two shore base rescuers uh, in this scenario. So uh, the communication is really critical here, and I, I want you all to pay attention to what our guide in this boat says to those people on the shore the rest of the trip. And also pay attention to the interaction between the people. Go get them, guys! Come on. So, th there's an issue here. Um, is, is and this goes back to the emotion. Like the level of emotion in this boat is completely disproportionate to the situation. Um, I I think what I would want to see in this boat is that someone, maybe our guide here, would take command of the boat, or the person behind the oars. Someone needs to be taking command of this rescue boat, and that person should be like delegating tasks. So one of the tasks would be get the victim's attention, tell them to swim away from the strainers. At the same time, you would want to communicate with those rafts on the shore and say, guys, get ready. There's a swimmer coming downstream. We need you to paddle out and get them. That's, that's what you want to communicate to them. Those teams on the shore, especially if they're commercial clients, they don't know what's happening. They're probably eating a snack uh, like in a situation like i've seen so many i've been in situations like this where my commercial crew is they're eating some fruit snacks and having a drink and they're talking about work next week uh they might be talking about the kid being like oh i hope he's okay um you know we haven't seen him for a while what's going on like there's a lot of other things going on that don't involve being ready for a rescue mm -hmm. um so uh, you know you want to communicate that's i mean i guess that's kind of the long and the short of it and and i mean you can hear it in their voice they're all talking over each other and panicking and all trying to do the same job of like getting uh the attention of the kiddo um whereas in they're not focusing on where they're going how they're paddling not really taking very good paddle strokes either um and it's just a bunch of kind of chaos in the boat so uh i'm i want to hop over to our little animated recap of this because from here on out um i mean it's, it's just a lot of fumbling around um uh, unfortunately like our guide gets out of the boat um and, and uh, you know i'm kind of doing this for the victim because the victim is a 10 year old boy i don't want to be plastering his face all over the internet um and we'll provide a link to the, the original video if you want to go watch it you can check it out but um what happens next is they they go to shore the kid comes down, uh, they grab the kid, the kid kind of hits the boat and then kind of the boat swirls around. So the kid's on the downstream side, mm -hmm. but now the boat is in the bushes 
and the bushes sweep one of the paddlers out. Uh, I think it's a gal in a white helmet gets knocked out of the boat. They pull the kid in, gal in the white helmet's on the upstream side of the boat. They pull her in and that, you know, that causes some amount of issues going on. So, uh, there's a lot going on and we'll kind of recap the end of it at the end of the video. Um, but for now, let's hop over to our little animated part and just go ahead and check that out real quick. Okay, so here we are with the overhead scene. We have the victim in red. Down below the victim and kind of to the right, we actually have a shore-based rescuer and you can see that person running downstream. Uh, they look like a raft guide. And then downstream of them uh, with a green dot kind of at the bottom of the screen that you can see, uh, there's another shore-based rescuer on the side of the river and and those locations are pretty much approximate but you can see them in the video on the side they do look like raft guides and as i mentioned before um that team of raft guides might be the team i would want in the boat so in the boat um and, and we kind of did some math on this we have about 1350 pounds of equipment and people and boat that we need to move and and based on our calculations a boat like this with an oar and paddle combo uh, based on some testing that we did can probably output about three to three and a half kilonewtons, which is somewhere around a thousand pounds of force. So if, if you just think of it like that, um, 1300 pounds of weight, thousand pounds of force, like the physics of that alone don't really make that much sense, but uh, we have a lot of downriver movement. So we got our boat up, up high on the river. So the boat launches, heads downstream, and, and again, this is a bit of a reconstruction, but they start to slow down right here, trying to make this gap. And their boat turns around at some point in that as they're getting ready to throw the bag. This is about where uh, the gal in the front throws the bag into the tree to the victim. At that point, they throw the bag um, and they get snagged on the tree. Um, which was pretty unlikely. So uh, there's a person running down the side and then they come loose. They sideswipe this tree right here. And, and what I actually didn't even put in here was the first potential wrap that they had. So while just before the boat started a pendulum back to the middle of the river, they hit a tree sideways. Uh, we have another tree that they hit sideways. And at this point, Somehow the victim got in the water. Um, I'm not sure how, and and you know, presumably they, this child saw the boat going away and maybe jumped in. Uh, somehow this victim went from static to dynamic and somehow got in the river, um, which is obviously extremely dangerous. Um, and there are boats careening downstream. They finally regain control and begin moving downstream. The, the child's moving with them, uh, but they don't see the child for a long time. Because again, there's lots of yelling, lots of talking, everybody's talking over each other. And it's about that point where they basically saw the child. Um, so that's kind of a reconstruction of what happened and, and how it went down. So after talking to my firefighter friend, there's a few options that we would have in here. And, you know, I'm not exactly sure which would be the best and how it would work. But uh, one thing I learned from the fire crews was a uh, technique called a Y lower, which would actually be really good if the river channel was smaller. So right here, you've got a rescue crew on the right. You got some shore based crew and you have a crew on the left by the uh, yellow. So with a Y lower, what you're going to do is you're going to get a rope out there. Then you're going to throw another rope to capture that rope and then pull it into one side of the river. From there, you're going to have a boat. You're going to attach a boat and you're able to manipulate that boat to lower it down. Here you see, we move it down to the victim, get the victim in the boat, and then the blue crew on the right can reel in their line and the yellow crew on the left can let some slack out. And then that victim goes to shore, shore base rescuer pulls them on to the shore. So that's a pretty good option if it was a small river channel. Um, it's a pretty cool technique. Um, I've only used it in training. I've never actually used it in a rescue, uh, but it, it could be doable 
but there's this problem. It is 388 feet for that white line to get across the river. That's impossible. Like, it, that just, it just won't work. So the, the Y lower, I mean, that's, that's not really a, a very plausible option that we can use here. The next option would be the tension diagonal. Tension diagonals are also known as like a zip line, some Swift Water Rescue uh, classes. But basically, get the victim on a line, slide them across to the side of the river. So you're gonna need several teams here to do this. And the only way I could, you have a 10 year old boy here. He's not gonna be able to do anything to assist you with setting an anchor or anything like that. So you got your blue rescue team here is gonna set up the tension diagonal. You got your green setting downstream safety. You're gonna have a raft with a swimmer or someone who you're going to deploy out to the person to make this happen. So you're going to get out there, you're going to slow your momentum down as much as you can and then deploy that person out. And then you're going to need to peel out with a raft and then you need to get to the shore as quickly as possible because that raft is going to set up safety and be an additional layer of downstream safety. From there, you're going to get that line across and you're going to set up that tension diagonal and you're going to get people on the tension diagonal. And the problem is that this kid does not have a swift water rescue harness and is not capable of operating that because they haven't been trained. But you're gonna get them, you're gonna slide down that line and then get the person to shore. And the, the reason we have the raft there ready is because if that person goes dynamic, you want that raft intercepting the person as that extra layer of safety to add in there. Next option that I would have, especially talking to the fire crews and, and if this was even possible, and there's a lot of reasons this wouldn't be able to happen is get a helicopter. You could have a helicopter fly in and you can deploy someone from the helicopter on a tether line um, and, and rescue that person. So the person is going to clip into a cable. They're going to be lowered down by the helicopter, make contact with their victim, get hands on, put a harness around the victim. We will fly the victim to the shore, drop the victim off on the shore and lower that air crew back up and they're going to fly off and get a hands on our victim. There's so many reasons why that couldn't happen. And, you know, they could have a problem with, uh, with the airflow in the Canyon. They could have a problem with the helicopter itself. There's, there's so many reasons that this might not work. And this would only be something that fire crews and professional rescuers would have to affect this rescue. Uh, so that's, that's something you got to, really think about and have a backup plan for. So resetting, one of the most plausible scenarios from um, the professional rescuer world, either uh, rescue watercraft or Zodiacs, that would be available to help, uh, to help out in this scenario. Because the water isn't moving so fast that uh, a boat wouldn't be able to go up it. But this is kind of uh, what was communicated to me as, as a good option was to be have two watercraft. So you want to have a team of two operating in tandem so that one watercraft is downstream, setting downstream safety for anybody who swims or, or anything like that, backing you up. Also have shore based safety. And this is that lower, that layered safety we're talking about. We have two shore based rescuers. We've got a second boat and they're going to approach and they're going to swing around. So they're facing upstream in the current and then they're going to slow their momentum down and come in close. Well, the second boat swings around and gets ready to intercept. They're going to load the swimmer onto there or the load the victim onto there. And if anything actually happened, like the victim was climbing onto the boat and fell out, you have that second boat to swing in, pick up that victim, and they're going to peel off and move downstream. So having these boats operating in tandem is kind of the, one of the best ways from a uh, professional rescuer standpoint if you have all of the assets in place which you may or may not have all right so let's talk about how we would deal with this scenario if we were presented with it um, you know if I'm a commercial guide I lose somebody they get caught in a tree or that happens on my trip um, I'm at a bit of a loss like honestly looking at that video I, I have a really hard time seeing a good way out without a lot of people involved. Mm -hmm. um, 110 feet to a victim, 
dude, that's a long way. Like, I, I know that you can't make the throws. I, I probably wouldn't be able to rely on people to make the throw. I can't rely on myself to make that throw. Like, mm -hmm. uh, how can I ask somebody else to do that? Um, you know, I, I don't know what... Do you have any ideas? Of yeah, I mean, it, it's a tricky situation because the the watershed is so large at that point, and you might have trouble like keeping uh, eyes on them. Um, you know, we had a couple people run up, but you have a bunch of full size trees in the river because that's not normally you know the riverbed. Um, so it, it's a tricky situation because at that point you're so far away when you're. Um, able to see the victim that you have trouble communicating with those other boats so a lot of times you don't have radios or anything like that on the river with you so it really is pretty tricky I think um, you know one of the ways I might try to attack it is and and, and this goes for like talking with my firefighter friends they kind of echoed this is like if you have a boat that you're deploying you want a solid crew and you, mm -hmm. you want a multi-boat team like one boat doesn't cut it it's not enough um, what happens if that boat wraps? You need to get people onto another boat, moving them downstream. Like you can't, I, I don't think it, it's enough safety, enough layers of safety for me to be comfortable with, to do this as in a single boat operation. Um, you know, we had a wrap not too long ago in the middle of a river with a strainer field down below and it became a multi-boat scenario for us like mm -hmm. we were moving boats around trying to, to get good angles and figure out where we need to be setting layered safety for each other um it it was a complex scenario and a scenario like this again another complex scenario um i feel like I feel like there's a stand of trees on river right and it would be possible to potentially set flip lines as an anchor around it almost like you were lead climbing um, on a rock wall like you'd have to set an anchor clip into it and then like move your boat to the next tree like mm -hmm. lasso the tree or throw a rope around the next tree use it two to one to pull your boat in throw it uh, an anchor around that and like hop and then you'd be within two boat lengths of the victim but again you got a strainer field down below like you might from that position you might be able to get a bag to the person have the person jump in throw a rope over their shoulder and come in but again i'd want downstream safety i'd want mm -hmm. multiple boats i would want multiple uh, like that's just an idea i mean it's not even a good idea it's well, just and, an idea and i think having that downstream safety who is being very very alert because they're not going to be able to necessarily communicate with you is super key and even if you could have even maybe a chain of people with an eyesight that can then communicate with each other, you might have to have two or three people kind of able to communicate to get from point A to point B. Um, so something like that of just having somebody ready to go as soon as they see the person to paddle out, if the kid did come into the water, you know, it's a, it's a pretty tricky situation. Um, but I think definitely that downstream safety is going to be key because eventually you know the victim was in the water and um i think some of the other boats were not ready to go get him even though they knew they were he was there so i think having at least one boat ready to go is is super good um also i think in this scenario i would be wanting to uh <laughs> really think about calling 911 um i i, I say that because I have trained with California firefighters and the level of training that a lot of California firefighters are receiving these days is pretty high. Mm -hmm. um, and and, and I, I've trained with firefighters from various different places around the country. And I have also found that their level of professionalism and ability to operate in water rescue environments has improved dramatically. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I and they have more assets available. And, and at a certain point, you just need more people there. You need more people to be able to do stuff, set up rope systems and, and operate that way. I mean, the kid's not going anywhere. He's he's on a tree. Like, yeah. you have time. And it may screw up your commercial trip logistics, but um, I, I don't know. I would prefer that that kid 
be brought home and this is what i always think about rafting trips is like that that's critical so um you know again like as boaters we don't have helicopters we don't have motorized watercraft that we're going to be able to deploy into a rescue scenario mm -hmm. we're, we're using minimal equipment tactics to try and do the best we can do so I, i'm i'm just throwing out ideas that you know if anybody watching has some other ideas that you think would be good for this man you know maybe we can set up a scenario where we try this out and see if those work I'd, you know i'd love to try it and love to hear all of your ideas and kick those back and forth but i think uh you know to kind of wrap up the video uh, this is a pretty long one so if you're if you made it this far we really appreciate <laughs> it um but i i think some of the things uh, you know there's a few things that we want to talk about mm -hmm. in, in terms of that so um you got a list yeah i have a little bit of a list so i think um some of the the focus is um having the expertise and the crew ready to make that rescue um generally you'll want to have people who have swift water training or some type of training uh, you're going to want to have the most experienced people in the water uh doing that um and just being aware of you know um moving your victim from a static point to a dynamic point. Um, it can be a little bit of an ego hit to feel like as boaters we can't solve that situation, but I wanna look at, okay, what could happen if the kid did go in the water? We have high water, we have strainers, he, we, and then we had a, a rope in the water as well. You know, I wanted that kid to make it home okay, so I might need to check my ego and, and call in for some help. Um, you, you might, do you really wanna think of getting the right assets in the right places mm -hmm. and if you have teams of people that are really good at paddling um and teams who are pretty inexperienced you might want to swap them out in a case like that i mean we're dealing with a private boater's boat so you know it's kind of up to them too but uh, i again i would ask to borrow their boat potentially um you know get their people out of the boat get my people into the boat people who I know can affect that rescue mm -hmm. with certainty. Um, and then also lighten that boat too. I think that's a big one that uh, we hadn't talked about yet was lightening the boat because you want less weight in the boat and more power to be able to zip in, kill all your momentum, kill all your downstream momentum and, and hover there as long as possible to get that kid over and grab someone, grab them and pull them in and then peel off downstream. Yeah, and I think another thing is, is not wanting to add any more victims to what's already happening. And we almost saw, you know, they could have wrapped, they could have swum everybody else who was in that rescue boat. You know, so not adding any more victims to the situation is going to be super key as well. And I think that kind of goes to one of your other points of downstream safety and getting yeah. the right people in the right place. Yeah. Um, and emotions. Yeah, so having that heightened sense of emotion, it's really hard to avoid. Um, but when you are heightened um, and then panic starts to set in, then you're not able to effectively see everything. You kind of get stuck in that tunnel vision. Um, so having somebody um, who can just direct what's happening um, is going to be really important to that effective rescue and making sure people are where they need to be and, and keeping that situation calm. Yeah, and, and I think um, also when you have a really heightened emotional state, you actually become a liability rather than an asset. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, that's that's something you really want to focus on. Um, I think one of the last things, though, too, is uh, we, did, we didn't show it. And again, I, I don't want to plaster this kid all over the Internet. But mm -hmm. uh, at the end of the rescue, they pull up on shore and the kid is lying in the bay on his back. Um, they undo his PFD take his helmet off and he's still lying there face up looking at the sky legs up over the side um and they're telling him to just relax and, and i i don't think that's highly effective yeah and i think the big thing is if he did swallow a lot of water he's in that situation where his lungs are down and so you want to get him um sitting up so that if he does have to spit out some water like he's able to do that without it going back into his lungs. So we want to avoid having any more aspirations, anything like that, helping him get that water out of his system. And if you're in that situation, uh, helping someone 
telling someone to relax it is not highly effective. Um, you know, Kaylee, I know you have anxiety on the river sometimes, <laughs> and, and saying to, to Kaylee, like, it's okay, just, just relax. Like, that doesn't help your anxiety, and that doesn't help a person trying to breathe. So what you can do in these situations is, is you, can, you can help someone breathe mm -hmm. through it, and I believe we have a video on, if it's not up yet, it will be later on, about the 444 technique where you mm -hmm. breathe in for four seconds, hold it for four seconds, and breathe out. Helping people to go into that, like, either either get control of their breathing, get control mm -hmm. of their physiology by, by doing breath exercises or, or helping them to breathe through. Uh, and then just being like, hey, it, it, you can even grab a person and just be like, okay, grab their hands, grab my shoulders, whatever. So just say, okay, follow me. Just breathe in. Just go. And, and just get them breathing and get a lot mm -hmm. of oxygen flowing into their lungs. Yeah. That can actually help way more than it seems. Yeah. Like, when, whether it's anxiety or it's, um, or it's like, recovering and, and being exhausted. So mm -hmm. uh, those are some things that you can probably use and some tips that, that would help. But, uh, Kaylee, anything else you'd like to add to this one? I think we about covered it. Well, we appreciate you all staying here for um, for this episode of mm -hmm. Crash and Learn. I know it was a long one. There's a lot to cover. There's a lot to unpack and a lot going on. This is also a pretty tough video to watch. Um, again, we're kind of armchair um, analyzing this, but uh, I, I really tried to give you all various different angles of how it happened and, and, and what happened. and. Uh, so I hope that helps. I hope this helps in your next rescue scenario. And, and if nothing else, just slowing down and getting the right assets in place mm -hmm. and, and really taking it seriously when you have a strainer issue or you're, you're dealing with something like this. Because, uh, you know, we're dealing with people's lives and we're trying to help bring people home. Yeah. And, and that's the core of it. So, uh, again, I... I'm not trying to hammer the people in the video. I'm not trying to attack them. What I want to do is I want to learn from this. And and we want to see boaters be better boaters in the end of the day. Um, and, and we hope that when you see this, you can take some of uh, these tactics or some of these ideas and say, okay, how can we think out of the box to safely affect this rescue mm -hmm. and also keep layered safety uh, to keep our emotional state in a place where we can actually deal with risk management and and work through rescue techniques and, and finally the last thing training 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 like if if you all just go out there and train once a month if, if you if you just train once a month do dedicated swift water rescue training put yourself in scenarios like work through different stuff swim across currents i mean you're gonna be in a good position later on down the road mm -hmm. but uh you know and and if you do it once a month throughout the entire year you do 12 scenarios every year uh even if that's all you do that's going to give you a huge edge when you get into something like this to be able to to make sure your emotional state is not disproportionate to the situation so hope that helps if you have questions drop those below thanks for watching we'll see you next time